Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to address you one more time on the theme of literature generally and the genius of Shakespeare more specifically. There is so much to say about that unique Protean imagination and the craftsmanship and mastery of language that this great poet and dramatist possessed, that no single lecture can do justice to his oeuvre. So today, I will focus on one example of how he used language in his plays, how the language served the play and enabled him to open new avenues in the theatre of his day. I will speak of Richard II. Indeed, if Shakespeare could see the feet of clay in his mighty heroes and never lost sight of the human dimension of historical dramas, he also recognized the humanity that is in the frailty of his weaker heroes. He gives them some of the most important and beautiful lines of the English language and invites the audience to recognize these multiple facets of their very human personalities. But Shakespeare was skillful in leaving enough ambiguity in his constructions so that his audiences would be able to participate in filling out his creations. That is why he speaks to people from different cultures who, as they do not speak English, are not as sensitive to the power of his language. And across time, despite the enormous changes that have occurred in our societies. So, we can find an Egyptian Lear, a Russian Hamlet, a Japanese Macbeth. His creations continue to intrigue and beguile and they're not being completely determined by having that element of contradiction that not only surprises but also opens up the possibilities for further and novel interpretations. So let us discuss how Shakespeare treats one of these frail and weaker heroes. Let us go to Shakespeare's history plays to see how he chose to present Richard II, a weak and capricious king who gets deposed by his cousin. It is one of the least performed of Shakespeare's history plays, although it repays a careful reading. So, first allow me to introduce the bare facts of the historical person of Richard II. Second, I would like to discuss the main levers of the play as I see them. Third, we can proceed with a brief analysis of the play's highlights. And then fourth, let us discuss how the complex character of Richard is developed with the participation of the audience. Finally, I will end with some general observations on what makes this play so interesting to me. So starting with the historical figure. Richard II, born in 1367, died in 1400, was the eighth and last king of England of the House of Plantagenet. Ascending the throne as a child of 10 in 1377, he was deposed at the age of 32 in 1399. Now the first major challenge of the reign was the Peasants' Revolt in 1381, which the young king handled well, playing a major part in suppressing the rebellion. In the following years, however, the king's dependence on a small number of courtiers caused discontent in the community of men who had political power. And he lost effective control of the government to a group of noblemen for a few years. In 1397, he took his revenge on the appellants, many of whom were executed or exiled. The next two years have been described by historians as Richard's tyranny. And in 1399, after John of Gaunt, the king's uncle, the king disinherited Gaunt's son, Henry of Bolingbroke, his cousin, who had previously been exiled, and who then invaded England in June 1399 with a small force that quickly grew in numbers, meeting little resistance Bolingbroke deposed Richard and had himself crowned as King Henry IV. Richard died in captivity early 
the next year. Now, as an individual, Richard was tall, good-looking, and intelligent. Richard's posthumous reputation, however, has to a very large extent been shaped by Shakespeare, whose play Richard II focused on the last two years of Richard's reign and portrayed Richard's misrule and Bolingbroke's taking over of the throne as possibly responsible for the 15th century Wars of the Roses. Now, the Wars of the Roses were a series of intrigues and plots and battles that pitted two branches of the Plantagenet lineage, the House of Lancaster, starting with Henry Bolingbroke, Henry IV, under the heraldic banner of the Red Rose, against the House of York, under the heraldic banner of the White Rose. Now, all of that was to end with another Richard, the infamous Richard III, who would be deposed by another Henry, this time Henry VII, who would establish the House of Tudor on the throne of England, and whose son, Henry VIII, would be one of the most famous monarchs in history. Let us now move to Richard II, the Shakespearean creation. Written in 1595, Richard II is close in date to Romeo and Juliet. It was politically sensitive. It treated of a king deposed by another and the end of the House of Plantagenet and the start of another dynasty, the House of Lancaster. Now, sitting monarchs did not like discussions of the possibilities of usurping the throne. But the play was allowed. It was popular and it was published as a quarto in 1597. But it was out of theatrical performance by 1601. But Shakespeare was not writing history for scholars. He was writing a play for the theater, and that required plot, characterization, and dramatic levers to maintain the momentum of the play and keep the audience engaged. So here I would like to discuss the main levers of the play as I see them. First is the story. It is about the rise of the future Henry IV and the decline of Richard II. The play, however, focuses only on the last two years of King Richard's life, when early successes have been forgotten and we see the capricious monarch making many unjust and unpopular decisions in a very arbitrary manner. We also see the emergence of Henry Bolingbroke, son of John of Gaunt, who will depose Richard and become the future Henry IV. This part of the structure is beautifully captured by the image of the buckets in Act IV. Now, second lever is the evolution of the character of Richard, which is constructed by an interaction of the audience with the successive appearances and speeches of the king. Now, the playwright's words are very skillfully deployed to allow Richard to evolve as a person so that he becomes a well-rounded character. But at the same time, and that is the difficult tour de force, the audience feels for him as a human being, but considers him unworthy of keeping the throne. Now, third, there are passages that reflect on what it means to be a king. Here are some of the most beautiful poetic statements in the English language are deployed to question the divine right of kings. Are they not mere mortals like the rest of us after all? And it opens the door a crack to the idea that the throne should go to the person who has the most merit, in this case, Henry Bolingbroke. Fourth is the emergence of the soliloquy as an important part of Shakespeare's toolkit. Now, it would be further developed, reaching its ultimate expression in the great soliloquy of Hamlet, to be or not to be. But it is here a powerful tool that Shakespeare deploys to establish a new kind of direct link between the character of Richard and the audience. 
So how are all these levers deployed in the play? Let us proceed with a brief analysis of the play's highlights. As we said, the play is composed of five acts covering only the last two years of Richard's life, which were called Richard's tyranny. Now, the first act sets the stage by starting with King Richard sitting on his throne in full regalia, exuding pomp and majesty. The king is to judge a dispute between his cousin Henry Bolingbroke and a certain Thomas Mowbray, whom Bolingbroke accuses of murder of the Duke of Gloucester. Although Bolingbroke's father, John of Gaunt, believes that the king himself is involved in the murder. Now, Richard fails to make a firm decision or to quiet the antagonists, and they decide to fight a duel. But King Richard interrupts the duel at the very beginning and sentences both men to banishment from England. And the king's decision can be seen as the first mistake in a series that will lead eventually to his overthrow and his death. In the second act, John of Gaunt, uncle of the king, dies. And Richard II seizes all his land and money, which rightfully belongs to his son Henry Bolingbroke, the king's cousin, and we learn from an angered nobility that Richard is mismanaging the country. He is wasting England's money, fining the nobles for crimes that their ancestors had committed, confiscating properties as he did with Gaunt's legacy. He is taxing the commoners and all of that to find his personal lifestyle and his desired war with Ireland. The enraged nobles help the banished Bolingbroke return to England and plan to overthrow Richard II. Now, King Richard leaves England to administer the war in Ireland and Bolingbroke takes the opportunity to assemble an army, invade the north coast of England and wins over the Duke of York whom Richard has left in charge of his government during his absence. Now Act 3 is the turning point of the play. We see Bolingbroke becoming stronger and stronger as the support for Richard melts away. Tellingly, Act 3 also contains the moment when Richard offers his belief that kings rule by divine right and cannot be deposed, for they are anointed by an irremovable balm, and as he tells those around him, not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm from an anointed king. Yet, it is also in Act 3 that Richard begins to see the end coming and recognizes the unstoppable rise of Bolingbroke and that he muses about the real meaning of being a king. It has some of the finest poetry in this play or any other play. Listen to this great speech by King Richard II reflecting on the frailty of worldly power and the mortality of kings. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered, for within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his court and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene, to monarchize, to be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which rolls about our life were brass impregnable. And humor thus comes at the last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall and farewell, king. Farewell, king. The pause and emphasis on the word king changes the sense of farewell and turns what could have been a pathos verging on bathos into a hard-edged sarcasm that underlines the thrust of mockery 
that runs through the whole passage. Now here, Richard, in this eloquent conclusion to this remarkable passage. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form and ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends, subjected thus. How can you say to me, I am a king? By the end of the act, Bolingbroke has moved from his first claims, which were limited to getting his land back, and now additionally claims the throne. Richard gives in, and we are now for the rest of the play to witness the continued rise of Henry Bolingbroke and the continued decline of Richard II. Now in Act 4, the actual transfer of power occurs, and Shakespeare gives Richard some very beautiful lines, including the abdication speech where Richard is foregoing the trappings and symbols of power that he hands over to the new King Henry, and he says, Mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head, and this unwieldy scepter from my hand, the pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With my own tears I wash away my balm, with my own hands I give away my crown, with my own tongue, deny my sacred state. With my own breath, release all duties, rights. All pomp and majesty I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues I forego. My acts, decrees, and statutes I deny. God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke that swear to thee. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved, and thou with all pleas that hast all achieved, long mayst thou live in Richard's seat to sit, and soon lie Richard in an earthly pit. God save King Harry, unkinged Richard says, and send him many years of sunshine days. What more remains? A transfer of power has been chronicled throughout the play, with the rise of Bolingbroke and the decline of Richard, and is beautifully captured in another great poetic image where Richard, in a speech in Act 4, sees the process as two buckets, one rising and one falling. Give me the crown. Here, cousin, seize the crown. Here, cousin, on this side my hand, on that side yours. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen, and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs, whilst you mount up on high. In Act 5, the final act, we see King Henry IV putting down latent rebellions and punishing the rebels, Richard is in prison in the castle of Pomfret, and Exton, an ambitious nobleman, goes to the prison and murders the former king. King Henry repudiates the murder and vows to journey to Jerusalem to cleanse himself of his part in Richard's death, a statement that some see as a Machiavellian effort to appear pious before the populace, for which Henry is already very popular. But it is telling that the transfer of power, which has been chronicled throughout the play, is also symbolically recaptured by the parallel between the beginning and the end of the play. Like bookends, the play that opened with Richard sitting on the throne in pomp and majesty now ends with Henry IV sitting on the throne in pomp and majesty. Shakespeare was to continue the story in his plays about Henry IV in parts one and part two, where we meet Falstaff and the young Prince Hal, who will then become Henry V, subject of a separate play by Shakespeare. But it is clear that the plays cover a continuing story, and there are some references here and there in the later plays that resolve some minor points 
left hanging in the earlier plays. But this play is really a lot more about the character of Richard II than it is about the events and plot which are so simple. Decline of Richard, rise of Henry. Far more interesting is the multifaceted creation of Richard, a weak king but endowed with the soul of a poet. Now seen from that angle, the play is important in several respects. It is not dominated by the plot or the external events that shape the conditions leading to this dramatic turn of events, the deposition of a king. It is not so much about the story as about the character of Richard. The play not only dissects the enigmatic personality of the king, it does so with the full participation of the audience as the playwright skillfully brings forth the inner thoughts of his protagonist. As Greenblatt observed, Richard II marked a major advance in the playwright's ability to represent inwardness. Inwardness, not exteriorization, inwardness. So now we have a play that will present a complex character and that invites the audience to focus on the character of the king. Now that is a task that requires exceptionally good acting. Good actors are needed to create complex characters. And thus the skills of a Burbage enabled Shakespeare to create complex characters. Indeed, acting at the time called personation was just being recognized as such at that time. But good actors need to be liberated from the sing-song delivery of totally metered and rhymed verse. They need a new dramatic language to explore the minds of the characters that they represent. And Shakespeare was able to throw convention to the winds, to use meter and rhyme when he wanted, as well as blank verse where it served his purpose. And thus, out of this collaboration between great actors and great writing, a new manner of great acting had been created, and it would keep the idea of acting Shakespeare at the top of the ambitions of aspiring actors all the way to this day in which we live. But Shakespeare gives us much more than beautiful words. He builds the character of Richard II in collaboration with the audience through the talents of the actor. He shows us complexity and evolution of the character through the play. Richard II is the first dramatic hero where Shakespeare actively promoted the duality of his inner soul and his public self. And Richard has a habit of studying himself as if from the outside, as it were, a habit emblematized in the scene where he sends for a looking glass. And when he smashes his reflection, his shadow, as he calls it, it is as if he was destroying his own substance. In a sense, uh, he is almost always calling for a mirror, finding in his reflection a king stripped of all his belongings, seeing himself as an analog of Christ, betrayed by Judases and condemned by Pilate, developing in a beautifully appropriate style, the figure of the two buckets. Richard II is complete in itself. The king is virtually the first of the tragic heroes of whom we discover an inner as well as a public life. The king is a bad ruler and a weak person, and his bad performance as a ruler is truly noted and Bolingbroke deposes him with relative ease. Yet, this weak Richard seduces the audience with the tune of his voice and the beauty of his language. Sometimes affected and self-pitying, it nevertheless imposes itself on the audience's mind. Listen, what must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? the king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? A god's name, let it go. 
I'll give my jewels for a set of beads, my gorgeous palace for a hermitage, my gay apparel for an almsman gown, my figured goblets for a dish of wood, my scepter for a palmer's walking staff, my subjects for a pair of carved saints, and my large kingdom for a little grave, a little, little grave, an obscure grave, or I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head, for my heart they tread now whilst I live, and buried once, why not upon my head? Now here we have a turning point in the play, a point that requires incredible skill in writing and acting, as it fulfills a double purpose. It allows us to feel for Richard and sympathize with him as a human being, someone who has suffered a savage loss, who falls from the uppermost reaches of power and majesty and is cast down into the abyss. But, and therein lies a skill, to make us feel that he was unworthy of keeping this high office. For Shakespeare gives the king elegant lines to speak but they also show us a weak, peevish self-pity rather than the dignified posture of one who deserves to bear a crown. One who could by his demeanor and his uh, uh, nobility at this difficult moment show how to confront disastrous turns of events with stately nobility. Now why does the passage work? Because it underlines that Richard considered that he is owed all that the king has, but does not show the slightest sense of obligation or responsibility that we all expect a monarch to have towards his duties. Now, Kermode puts it succinctly when he says, this pathos serves a double purpose. It touches the hearers, but at the same time convinces them that self-pity is not a quality to be admired in a monarch. It is founded in a sense of violated privilege and no thought whatsoever of obligation. Now that we talk of a collaboration between author and audience, we must underline an additional complexity. And that is the duality of the audience that Shakespeare was writing for. On one level, he had the educated and sophisticated aristocrats and gentry, whose taste and even language was special to them. And then there were the masses, largely uneducated and illiterate, that filled the ground of the theater. They spoke a different language. And if Shakespeare relied on the aristocrats for sponsorship and political support, he relied on the groundlings for his financial survival. As Ted Hughes has observed, Shakespeare's audience made certain demands that no audience has repeated since. They comprised two distinct audiences. Along the upper edge sat the aristocracy, the intellectual nobility, in some ways as formidably educated and as exactingly cultured as Englishmen have ever been. And along the lower edge, in large number, were the common populace, the groundlings, many of whom could neither read nor write. How Shakespeare's language and dramatic formulations solved that problem has been splendidly elaborated by Hughes, and he even talks of a formula that Shakespeare used in his writing to be able to reach both parts of his audience and unite them in that desired interaction with the play. But wait, wait. There is another aspect to this complex rhetorical maneuver by Shakespeare. Yes, this kind of language is admirably suited to show the weak and vain side of Richard, one that would alienate the audience from him. But at the same time, it also lays the foundation for the audience to relate to him more as a human being, to relate to him more later in the play as we are invited to share in the evolution of his thinking as he overcomes his peevish self-pity and develops a more reflective and philosophical posture. It does so by establishing the technique of the soliloquy, 
as a verbal link between the character's inner thoughts and the audience. And by exposing his weaknesses, it also exposes that he has indeed been wronged and thereby creates the necessary mental posture of empathy to appreciate him when the wrong remains and the weakness is transformed into reflection and thoughtful interaction, if not acceptance of his unfortunate condition. And indeed, when we see him at the end of the play, the effect is changed. Here the king speaks thoughtfully. And although Shakespeare has made use of soliloquies before Richard II, this will be the first to produce this effect of serious meditation. It is a long meditation, where in a stolen, frozen moment of time, the character is allowed to share with the audience his torment, his inner thoughts, and the struggle of his conscience and intellect. Now here are a few lines from that meditation. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father and these two beget a generation of still breathing thoughts and these same thoughts people this little world in humors like the people of this world for no thought is contented. The better thought as thoughts of things divine are intermixed with scruples and do set the word itself against the word and thus come little ones and then again, it is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the posture of a small needle's eye. Whatever I be, nor I, nor any man, that Batman is, with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. Now note the complexity with the suggestion of self-regard in the rhymes and antithesis of the last few lines. It may be that the need to represent, to provide for the personation of a king full of tender self-regard made the inwardness of those later Shakespearean soliloquies possible. It opened up a new rhetorical age, a range that Shakespeare was to explore almost alone. The grammatical concision of the lines prefigures the great things of the future. The art of the great soliloquy was born. Indeed, in this meditation, we see some interesting dualities. Beyond the obvious one of the inner and public self, there is the dialogue between the mind and the soul. There is the ability of Richard to look at himself as if from the outside and discuss his own condition. And finally, there's also the general duality of the play between Bolingbroke and Richard, a duality well captured in the image of the buckets. But is that poetry uniquely English, or does it travel across space and time? At the outset, I did say that Shakespeare was the universal genius that creative minds keep turning to time and time again. An Egyptian Lear, a Russian Hamlet, a Japanese Macbeth. All possible, for great works of art allow others to take from them and build the new artist's creation. They have that studied ambiguity that peculiar imagery, that powerful mystery that invites such interaction. So let us go back to Richard II and one of the great passages of the play, The Two Buckets and its concluding line. And Richard says, the bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs whilst you mount up on high. And Bolingbroke says, I thought you had been willing to resign. And Richard II replies, my crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my grief. Still am I king of those. And this last line is the line taken as a refrain in the beautiful, powerful poem of Aragon about occupied France after its fall to the Nazis in 1940 
and the poem is called Richard the Second Forty, Richard de Quarante, where the refrain is Je reste roi de mes douleurs, I remain the king of my pains or my griefs. He uses it as a closing fifth line after a quatrain, rhyming A, B, A, B, and then B, and then C, B, C, B, and then B, and so on. Listen to the powerful lines of Aragon. Ma patrie est comme une barque qu'abandonnèrent ses haleurs, et je ressemble à ce monarque plus malheureux que le malheur qui restait roi de ses douleurs who remained king of his pains and griefs. That is how powerful the figure of Richard II has interacted with artists, not just in the English tradition, but outside of it. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we have to note several important aspects to this play. It sets the stage for Shakespeare's subsequent history plays and certainly can be considered the first in a tetralogy of the Henry plays. It raises questions about the right of kings to rule by simple hereditary right and introduces the Machiavellian concept of government by an able prince. It invites the audience to interact with the writer in defining the character of Richard and establishes a remarkable evolution in the personality of the king. It deals with dualities in interesting and intriguing ways. And it introduces the art of the soliloquy to enable the audience to share in the character's inner thoughts. And it has some very fine thoughts and excellent poetry to boot. Above all, I think, the skill deployed in showing the evolution of Richard's character and the ability to get the audience to feel for him as a human being as he becomes more reflective and thoughtful while still recognizing that he was a bad ruler is quite an achievement, a tour de force that makes this play deserving of more recognition than it has received. Through the work of the pioneers of semiotics, we have learned that text is a construct of both author and reader. We bring to it our aspirations and our fears, our hopes and our dreams, our concerns and our memories. The skillful writer is one who opens up possibilities. And Shakespeare is more than skillful. To use the words of Seamus Heaney, used in another context, Shakespeare's language is seductive by the run of his verse it is distinctive by its posture in the mouth and in the ear, remarkable in its constant drama of tone and tune. But more importantly, the temporal and the didactic passes away with time, and the work that engages us intellectually and emotionally is the one that remains. And Shakespeare's work certainly remains, and so does the inwardness of his characters. Now, the word strategic opaqueness is the one that is chosen as the key to explain the successful promotion of this inwardness. If it starts with Richard II and evolves in Julius Caesar, it finds its true strength in Hamlet. And as Greenblatt observes, Shakespeare had reinvented the tragedy by radical excision. He had rethought how to put a tragedy together, specifically he had rethought the amount of causal explanation a tragic plot needed to function effectively and the amount of explicit psychological rationale a character needed to be compelling. And Shakespeare found that he could immeasurably deepen the effect of his plays, that he could provoke in the audience and in himself a peculiarly passionate intensity of response if he took out a key explanatory element, thereby occluding the rationale, motivation, or ethical principle that accounted for the action that was to unfold. Now, the principle was not the making of a riddle to be solved, but the creation of a strategic opacity. This opacity, Shakespeare found, released an enormous energy that had been at least partially blocked or contained by familiar and reassuring explanations. 
for Shakespeare with his poetic talent, his mastery of technique, his unerring sense of drama and his insightful understanding of human nature creates clever multi-layered plays and prismatic characters and Shakespeare opens up unending vistas, multiple mirrors and windows, imaginations that engage us and our intellect and we find and lose ourselves in his creation as each successive generation interacts and reinvents his text. Ben Jonson was right. Shakespeare is indeed not of an age, but for all time. Thank you.